Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, The Upcoming Revolution in Lateral Flow Diagnostics. In this webinar, we will present an overview of the lateral flow diagnostics and the way that nanocomposites can help improve assay performance, and some examples of how we've helped clients in their lateral flow format. My name is Rebecca Hart, and I work here at Nanocomposites in the Sales and Marketing Department, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I would now like to introduce Dr. Stephen Olderberg, founder and CEO of Nanocomposites, and Richard Baldwin, chief scientist. Stephen Richard. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, so this is this is Steve Oldenburg, and I've got Richard Baldwin here with me. Good night. This is Richard. Yeah. And uh, before we get started, we're we're going to uh, just talk to you a little bit more about kind of Nanocomposites' mission while we give everybody a chance to to make sure that they've uh, they've arrived for the webinar. So. As Rebecca said, we're you know we've got a, a real broad range of capabilities in terms of making materials, but but our focus is is really helping people use those materials to to bring things uh, bring things to market. So, if you're right at that conceptual stage, we've got lots of different particles that people can buy off the shelf to experiment with and and build prototypes. Um, if that's successful, then often people will come back and and uh, require larger batches or sort of custom formulations, and um, if those experiments work, then we, then we can move into a different mode where we can really help people finish the R&D, and uh, if their, their R&D work uh, looks like it's going to lead to a product, then we can help them with that, that transfer to manufacture and that scale up. So really, uh, it's an exciting place for us. We've got um, a dozen or so more startups that, that we're helping uh, accelerate out into the market, and uh, lateral flow is, is one of our uh, our, you know, one of our main areas that we're that we're interested in in developing and uh, and productizing. So, the title of this webinar is the upcoming revolution in, in lateral flow diagnostics. Uh, there's a number of factors here that are that are leading to what I think is going to be an explosion in interest in this uh, in this already ubiquitous technology. Uh, so this this talk we're going to give a background on what lateral flow is. I'm going to talk uh, about some of the the, the particles and and uh, and some of the reporter molecules that are that are used in order to increase uh, sensitivity and to to build some of these assays. And then we're going to to link that to some some new reader technologies that are coming out that are really going to help proliferate uh, the sort of the use and utility of, of lateral flow diagnostics in uh, in the market. So with that, uh, lateral flow assays. It's, um, it's a, Assays are strip tests. They're very simple devices that are intended to detect either the presence or absence of a target analyte in a sample without the need for specialized and caustic uh, equipment. The, the, uh, the test that you guys might be most familiar with is the pregnancy test. So this is available in every uh, drugstore. And the red lines that you see in that pregnancy test that indicate if you're pregnant or not are actually gold nanoparticles. And so, you know, in terms of uh, a nanotechnology that's that's really been in people's hands and they didn't know about it. That's that's probably one of the, the the leading applications. In addition to pregnancy, there's a whole slew of clinical and point of care testing that's that's being done with these rapid flow um, test strips. Veterinary diagnostics uh, use the um, use these quite a bit to get an instant readout um, as as people bring in their pets. Uh, drug testing, quality assur assurance, and and a whole slew of of other applications. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Richard to, just talk, to talk to you a little bit about some of the assay components and, and what makes up a, a lateral flow strip. So th this uh, strip we have, or this figure we have here, is uh, a general lateral flow strip. It, it's really a pretty straightforward technology. What you have is you have a sample pad where you apply a sample. The liquid from the sample flows along. It dissolves out some colored nanoparticles from the conjugate pad. Those colored nanoparticles flow along the strip to the test line, where in the presence of the analyte, they give rise to a signal, and then they're wicked along into the wicking pad or the sump. Um, it's a super simple piece of technology, or simple in conception anyway, but you end up with quite a lot of com complicated chemistry on, uh, on this strip. One of the appealing things about lateral flow tests is that they can really be cheap. Once you've got it all worked out, um, and you're making it at a very large scale, you can make these strips for 30 cents a go. So there's two general sorts of um, 
lateral flow strips that people build. They either build a, a direct sandwich assay or a competitive assay. Um, in the direct sandwich assay, you have an analyte that basically bridges between um, an affinity ligand on the nitrocellulose and an affinity ligand on your reported nanoparticle at the test line. And in the presence of the analyte, the nanoparticle gets bound to the test line and you get a signal. Um, the second sort of assay that people build are competition assays, where you have um, the analyte both on the nitrocellulose and potentially the analyte in your sample to be detected. If the uh, analyte is taken up by the affinity ligand on the nanoparticle, the nanoparticle won't bind to the test line and your signal is inversely proportional to the amount of analyte that's present. We use the sandwich assays when they're, they're, the analyte is big enough that you can detect two different, or you can bind to two different epitopes on whatever your analyte is. And we use the competition assay where your analyte is too small to have two different epitopes for antibodies to bind to. For reporter particles, we've got um, a whole slew of, of different choices associated with, with what we can use for the, the readout of the lateral flow. And the point here is that when we get a binding event, we, we want to be able to, to see that binding on that strip. We want to have maximize the contrast of, uh, of the particles against, against the background. And so we can do that in a couple of different ways. One way is to have metal nanoparticles that are, are gold or silver. And uh, these particles have um, some really unique optical properties which, which make them very high contrast agents. And I'll talk a little bit more about those next. The other reagent that's commonly used for reported particles is the dyed latex beads. And those, those are right up the strip. They have different colors and you can, and you can uh, visualize them on the strip as well. Uh, in addition to absorbance, there's a, another technique where um, instead of looking um, at it optically, we can use a, a machine readout, and, and typically that's fluorescence. So what, what this allows you to do is illuminate the sample with one wavelength of light, and then you will be able to read out the sample with uh, another wavelength of, of light, and that gives you, uh, minimizes the background and can, can kind of increase your, your sensitivity with it. But the downside is that you, that you need a more complex reader in order to, to quantify that, that measurement. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of other types of, of particles that people have tried to use. An example is magnetic particles, where it's mag read magnetically. And you know, there's just this constant level of, of innovation associated with you know, how do we maximize the signal? How do we get the, you know, the, most, the most recognizable event when, when one of these binding events comes because that's going to, it's going to dictate what our, our limit of detection is going to be. So talking a little bit more about the specifics of gold, um, there's a, the reason why the gold nanoparticles are so interesting is that they have really this unique material property uh, called plasmon resonance. And what this means is that gold particles of a certain size or shape um, strongly interact with, with incident light. And they, um, the, the, the electrons in the, in the particle can become polarized and under a very specific condition, they can actually um, make this polarizability, this denominator goes to close to zero and all of a sudden this polarizability is, is very large. And that means that the interaction of light can be actually much larger than the physical cross-section of the particle, which is, you know, just doesn't happen in the macro world. But we take advantage of that in, in this plasmonic space to give us a very high contrast reagent. So, so then the question is, well, out of all the gold particles, what would be the, the optimal size? And so here's a, uh, a range of different, um, uh, of different particles from about 10 nanometers up to 100 nanometers. You can see that they're mostly red. The industry itself, for whatever reason, has, has sort of settled on, uh, on 40 nanometer diameter as being one of the most common sizes for, for, for these lateral flow assays. And the, there's a few reasons for, for why 40 nanometer was, was, to, uh, was selected. It turns out that as you increase the size of the particles from sort of zero to 100 nanometers, the percent of light that's either absorbed or scattered in the particle changes. So at the smallest particles, they're almost all absorbing. And then as you get larger, you get a much, um, you know, much reduced absorption, which means you have a much higher scattering. And since these particles are on a white background, it's the absorption component that's really important for, for lateral flow. And so this other chart here shows the, the absorption cross-section then um, plotted as a function of, of diameter. And it doesn't just keep going up 
um, monatomically because at, at these higher diameters, since it's mostly scattering, you're, you're actually sort of taking a hit. So you really want to be kind of along this, this high slope line of which 40 nanometers down is, is here on the slope, and then there's some other candidates uh, up in the 50 and 60 nanometers, and those are sizes that, that people do use in, in lateral flow as well. So the main reasons uh, for, for gold, uh, other than the, it's this it's very bright reporter monocle, it's clean, it's got a very stable surface for antibody absorption, uh, and that uh, the, the reproducibility and the chemistry for making these, these materials is, is well, under, well understood. So for, uh, for once you've got the, the particle, then the next step is, is how, do you, how do you make that biologically active? And in, in most cases in lateral flow, you're, you're binding a, a targeting molecule and it's typically an antibody. So I'll let Richard talk a little bit about sort of the two mechanisms that are used in order to um, in order to attach an antibody to uh, to a gold nanoparticle for lateral flow. Okay, I, I'd, I'd like to start just a bit by talking about a couple of other reasons why people use the 40 nanometer gold. Um, red shows up very well if you're reading things by eye. Um, it's better than say a strong yellow signal. A strong red signal simply shows up better. The second reason is that I think when people were first making these particles, um, some of the initial early syntheses just happened to drop out 40 nanometer gold particles. People got lucky and they just stuck with something that was simple and easy to make. So there's, there's two different ways of attaching things to the surface of these 40 nanometer gold particles. Um, the first that I'm going to talk about here is passive absorption. Um, it's relatively straightforward. You simply take the antibody and mix it with a gold colloid and the, the antibody passively absorbs to the surface of the gold. Um, you end up with interactions between things like the amines and the thiols and the antibody, and these just simply act as ligands to, to bind the, the antibody to the surface of the gold. There's a couple of challenges with passive absorption. Um, the first is that every antibody needs some degree of optimization because you're reliant on lining up the um, PI of the antibody and the zeta potential of the surface of the gold, so you need to fiddle with the pH. You also need to uh, carefully adjust the concentration of the antibody with respect to the gold. Um, we make a particular variant of the 40 nanometer gold that is pH stabilized to be between about 8 and 8.5, which is optimum for most antibodies. And we can generate large and very reproducible lots with uh, ISO 13485 compliant manufacturing. So the, the uh, passive absorption of the gold is great sometimes, but it has a, cu a couple of challenges. And we overcome some of these challenges through the use of covalent chemistry. Um, Nanocomposites has developed some surface modification of the 40 nanometer gold particles where we can, using a thiol ligand on the surface, generate carboxylic acids distal to the gold. So you end up with a gold particle that has carboxylic acid functionality. What this means is we can generate amide bonds to the surface of the gold particle from the antibody. So we take the carboxylic acid, we um, activate the carboxylic acid using EDC, trap that activated species with the NHS ester, and then the NHS ester can react with the primary amine in your antibody and generate a covalent bond to the surface of the, the uh, gold nanoparticle. So the covalent binding has a, a whole range of different advantages over the fizzes option. The first is that it generates a much more stable bond. This means that it leaves you a lot more space for um, potential other chemistry on your test strip without displacing the antibody from the surface of the gold. Um, it lets you rapidly screen antibody pairs. We've yet to find an example where um, we got a completely non-functional conjugate by just, in the, in the case of doing the covalent binding, whereas in the case of the um, phys absorption, sometimes we get antibodies that simply don't bind. So if you're rapidly screening antibody pairs at the start of electrical flow development, it can be much better to just use the covalent binding. Um, we find that in some cases we need a lot less antibody in an optimized assay than we do with the, the fizzazorbed case. And in, in some cases we can use the covalent chemistry 
to um, increase the sensitivity of the assay or adjust the amount of antibody that's on the surface of the gold. We're very happy to provide all the protocols for covalent binding. Um, it doesn't cost any more than the, um, the Physisorb or gold for Physis option. We're happy to teach you how to do it. Great. All right. And so when we first got interested in lateral flow, I mean, certainly we had the ability to make 49 meter gold and, um, and to supply uh, people with you know, the, the functionalized gold that could be useful for, for both types of binding chemistries. But we also asked ourselves, well, well why 40 nanometer gold? And I, I showed you earlier that there were some advantages associated with the plasmonics, but we, we also make a whole range of different sizes and shapes and, and surfaces for, um, you know, for these classes of, uh, of plasmonic materials. And some of these materials are relatively new. They haven't been, in, been around that long. And it wasn't clear whether people had actually tried these, these particles for lateral flow to see if they, if they had advantages over what had been traditionally used. So we went back into our library. We, we, we investigated a, a range of different substrates that we thought would be of interest, so gold nanoshells, gold nanorods, these are some silver cubes that we make. There's some gold nano stars that are a little bit spiky, and they, that shifts their absorption out into the, the red. Uh, we've got some recipes for making a, a hollow gold nano shells. So uh, instead of having a, a silica core like the, the, um, the gold nano shells we traditionally make, these are hollow. And then we also have the ability to make plates, uh, these silver nano plates uh, with different dimensions that, uh, that target different wavelengths. And so what we what we found was that, it, and you know, on our initial first pass was that the, the gold nano shells actually worked pretty well. And, and the reason for that is, um, is uh, it, you know, there's a couple of different reasons. One is is that the silica particles uh, at the core, so this is how we make them. We start with a silica particle, we stud them with small gold, and we grow that gold bigger until they get encapsulated into a, a complete shell. That, that silica core is very uniform, so we can start with something that's uh, you know, 100 or 120 nanometers in diameter. We put this 10 or 12 nanometer thick gold layer on it, and we've got uh, a very monodisperse, high extinction cross-section particle where the density of the particle, because the silica has a, a much lower density than the gold, is actually a lot lower than a, sol a solid gold particle would be. So we've got sort of the advantages of that gold particle surface, the advantages of the plasmonics at a lower density that allows these particles to, to flow well and to have good dynamics associated with with interaction with the, the test strip. And in our hands, we're getting anywhere from sort of two to 20 fold enhancements in the, in the sensitivity over standard 40 nanometer gold. Uh, here's a, a, an example of a, a lateral flow sandwich assay, and I'll let Richard walk through sort of the details of, of, of these results. So the, the way we like to think about the gold nanoshells is that their optical density per particle is much higher than the 40 nanometer gold spheres. What that means is that for a given binding event, for each binding event, you have a much stronger optical signal. And this, this is a pretty good example of um, an assay where, that we developed for a company called iCalQ, where the use of the gold nanoshells gave us a much more potent signal and was able to move us into the, um, what's called the clinically relevant range of um, a glycoprotein hormone in human plasma. So if we look at the bottom, um, that basically is an example of the, the advantages of the gold nanoshells. We've built two different lateral flow assays here. The top one with the red line is regular 40 nanometer gold. The bottom one with the black line is the uh, gold nanoshells. Um, if you look at the, the top series of lateral flow strips, we are bombing out for the, um, for the 40 nanometer gold at about five milli IU per liter. Whereas in the case of the gold nanoshells, uh, we're able to detect things as low as 0.16 milli IU per liter. And we go back up to the, the graph at the top. This is, um, this is a machine readout that rather than by eye. And you can see that you can clearly read all the way down to 0.16 in the case of the gold nanoshells whereas the 40 nanometer gold, gold spheres, our signal disappears sometimes after, after 2.5 milli IU per liter. Um, in this particular case, we got at least a 20 fold improvement in sensitivity from the gold nanoshells. We've done this for a bunch of different sandwich assays now. We've done it for malaria, 
for looking for the presence of Lyme disease in ticks, um, for lower load, which is a worm disease in, in Africa, as well as a bunch of other infectious disease and veterinary diagnostic analytes, and HCG, which everybody likes to use as sort of the, the benchmark assay. As well as being able to engineer core, simple core shell structures, we can also engineer quite complicated core shell structures. Um, this is an example of, of one of these materials. So another way that you can increase the sensitivity is if you can concentrate your sample to start with. Um, to do this, what we've done is we've built our um, gold nanoshells, but this time instead of a pure silica core, we've got magnetic particles in the center of the gold nanoshells. And in this experiment, we've taken um, a dilute solution of HCG and some anti-HCG antibody functionalized nanoparticles. These are the nanoparticles that have the magnet in the center. And we've concentrated this dilute solution of HCG using a magnet. So the, the HCG hormone is captured by the magnetic gold nanoparticles and then we pull all of those magnetic gold nanoparticles down to one point. We then resuspend the, the magnetic gold nanoparticles and what we have at the bottom is a comparison between using the nanoparticles without concentration and using the nanoparticles with concentration. And you can see that you, can see that you get a dramatic increase in the signal when you've concentrated this, the sample using a magnet. Um, th this is a pretty neat thing because a lot of analytes, you have access to a lot of, a lot of material, say urine for instance. We only need 20 microliters to run a strip and you can easily get know, hundreds of mils of urine. So you could concentrate that down and look for very low abundance analytes just through the simple use of a magnet. Another, uh, another more complicated material that we've developed are these metal core quantum dot on silica materials. And I'll let Steve talk a little bit about these. Okay, sure. So, so here the idea is that we're, we're using um, the metal core as a plasmonic antenna. So this is what's, what's focusing and concentrating the light. We've got a silica shell to, to provide a spacer uh, away from that metal surface. And then we're putting not just one, but, but in, in most cases, hundreds, up to sort of 200 for, for this particular example, quantum dots on the surface. And then we do some covalent chemistry off of the surface to bind that to antibodies and use these as, as probes. And so what this allows us to do is to sort of leverage the, the, you know, the optical properties of a, of a quantum dot, but instead of just having one quantum dot uh, bound to uh, an analyte, we can get a, we build a, a resonant particle that amplifies the light and allows us to get sort of 200 uh, quantum dots onto a single particle. So this has some advantages in terms of, of sensitivity. And the, the, uh, the example here shows just the, the binding of europium beads. So europium is a, um, it's another commonly used um, fluorescent particle uh, in lateral flow and it's kind of the standard for sort of ultra sensitive detection. And here you can see that for sort of 100 nanometer and 200 nanometer sizes, you can, you can see the particles, um, but they also have this, this issue where that if you illuminate them for a long time, that the, the fluorescence will bleach and it'll fade and actually go to zero where it's where, or at least make it much more difficult to see. So one of the advantages of the dot constructs is that initially they're very bright and that they hold that brightness over time, even under intense illumination. Here's a, an example of what it looks like on our reader. This is um, a, a scan of the, of the fluorescence as a function of position, and we've got our control line that's, that's very bright, and then we've got these test lines. So this is actually how we quantify the data from, uh, from, from these assays. So at, uh, at relatively high HCG concentrations, it, you get this, this large signal, and then if we integrate under the curve, you can uh, get a, a test line intensity that's quantified as you go from, from very bright signals down to dim. So here we're, we're getting down to sort of the 0.1 milli IU per mil um, for HCG, which is um, sort of an order of magnitude better than, than sort of the, the, the best pregnancy tests that are out on the, on the market today. So these, these particles are providing a, a very sensitive readout for, um, for, this, for this particular assay. And then lastly, we've sort of, you know, we've sort of touched on the, the first two elements of you know, the developing new probes and then new, new chemistry. The other exciting development in, in lateral flow has to do with readers. So 
this is the really the ability to quantify. You know, with your eye, you're very good at saying yes, no. But if you really want to know numbers, then you're going to need some kind of a machine readout. So there's um, there's these benchtop instruments that are they're robust and reliable, but they're really not suitable for many point of care or mobile applications. So one company that we've been working with is is iCalQ, and 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 they've developed some uh, some hardware that attaches to cell phones and iPads and, and other things that, that, that is, is looking to make this bridge between you know, reading by your eye and having something very simple that you can quantify and, uh, and produce some, um, get some, some more interesting data uh, from, from these lateral flow strips. And so when you're, when you're thinking about how to accomplish this, there's, there's definitely some, some, some design constraints. You know, how, what light source are you going to use? What's the color temperature? You've got calibration. You've got costs. You've got controls. There's a regulatory environment where you don't you don't really want to be switching out different cell phones. The FDA would really like you to have a, a common platform, so you're, there's some restrictions there. Uh, you've got some uh, some issues associated with intellectual property. But overall, what's what's happening is that there's this there's this real drive to 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 create this coupling, and with this coupling. Uh, we think that this is really going to be the, the you know, the, this revolution in, in the use of, of lateral flow. Where you know, we can almost think about it as sort of the extension of, of your Fitbit, where instead of getting your steps, you're you're doing a quick test with uh, either saliva or a, a finger prick with blood, and you're you're putting that into your, uh, your 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 reader and attaching that to your phone, and then you've got this way of of tracking things with time, and that can be. Um, that can be your stress levels. That can be some, you know, some some other biochemical feedback associated with uh, with workouts or your health. And there's just a whole slew of, of possibilities in this space. You know, you know, the in the third world, you've got rapid detection of infectious diseases. Uh, you've got uh, this whole focus on point of care and diagnostics. And then you've uh, another important um, is, is sort of the complement these complementary diagnostics where you can take this test to, to see if you if you really need to take this drug and, and be doing that on on a, on a continuous basis adjusting dose you know doing other fine tune fine tuning that that just really isn't practical to do in a in a doctor's office or to make extra trips for but if you had the device in your hand it would it would be convenient and potentially really important so Overall, there's a, a recent study by Markets and Markets that showed that, um, that, that this area is growing, 8% growth from, from 2015 to 2020, reaching sort of a $7 billion market. So this is, this is a, a, a really interesting product sector that, that is, um, I think, really po poised to, to, to take off and have a, have a huge impact. And lastly, is you know we you know, we're making uh, you know in addition to making the particles, uh, we've actually got a a full fabrication and in-house development lab in lateral flow. So uh, we're really interested in just trying to help people get things out to market, and whether that's you know simply providing you know, large-scale, cost-effective 40 nanometer gold particles um, for already approved lateral flow tests, or whether uh, you want to work with us to really, really think about the nuances of, of covalent binding strategies to increase your stability, or reduce your antibody costs, or just to accelerate the development. And then finally, we've got uh, an, an initial probe, these nanoshells, that, that look like they're giving us a, a very large increase in, in the sensitivity. So if you've got an assay that's been developed and you weren't quite there, then this is something that uh, with a quick, you know, with a switch, you might be able to actually hit the that ther therapeutic relevant range and, and get that assay out to market. So, I uh, encourage you to to contact us if if there's anything that you have in terms of, of questions or concerns or um, you know some, some some pain points or, or problems that that you really want to solve within that that development space. So so with that, I'm going to kind of open it up to to questions and. Uh, um, I also encourage you to, to visit our, our website. We recently put out a, a, a handbook on lateral flow assay development guide. It has it's full of a bunch of information that we wish we had um, two years ago when we were starting this process. And uh, um, yeah, I encourage you to, to use that as a starting point to, to learn more. Rebecca, you want to take things back over and um, see if there's uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Stephen and Richard, um, and thank you to our audience. Um, 
you know, for your attention. We're going to uh, just go ahead and take some questions. Um, just a reminder, if you haven't uh, submitted a question yet and you'd like to, please um, go ahead through the question pane and, and we'll um, try to answer those in this section. Um, so our first question today uh, comes from Charlie. Um, this was in referring to the lateral flow sandwich uh, assay slide. Um, the color of the nanoshell uh, test and control line is black. Why is this? So th the reason why it the reason why these particles have a given color, it's to do with where they're absorbing or um, scattering light. Um, in the case of the gold nanoshells, they have a pretty broad absorption component and that leads to them appearing black. They're basically absorbing across the visible region. That's why they're black. Th this black color actually has a pretty significant advantage and that is if you're running tests in blood, um, it it shows up differently to blood itself. If you happen to lyse some red blood cells and you have some hemoglobin on your test strip, it's not going to interfere with the black color of the gold nanoshells. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, our next question comes um, from Gary. Um, if I have my assay optimized using covalent 40 nanometer gold, uh, how easy would it be for me to switch to uh, the gold nanoshells? Um, sometimes it is an absolute simple drop-in replacement. You do the, the chemistry on the gold nanoshells and they pretty much work straight away. Um, sometimes you have to modify a little bit of the chemistry to get it to work. Um, the gold nanoshells are a little bit larger. If you're using very, very fine grain nitrocellulose, sometimes you have to drop down in the, the use a more porous nitrocellulose. Um, but in general, we don't find enormous difficulties in changing from 40 nanometer gold to the gold nanoshells. Thank you, Richard. Um, this question is from Young. Um, how do you measure the size or number <coughs> uh, or concentration of nanoparticles for R&D and manufacturing process, um, referring to QC? Right, so, so we have a couple of, of different ways uh, of doing that. The, our primary method for doing concentration is to do a dissolution of the metal and then to measure the concentration with ICP mass spec. And the, the other way that we, we monitor is the, the UV vis. These particles are, are very consistent in size and shape and there's actually really strong correlations between theory and experiment. So in some cases we can uh, actually do some theoretical modeling and um, and have a predicted optical density per mig uh, of the material. The, the final way that we've done um, concentration is we, um, we so it's a newer instrument we just got in, in, in house which is a, a Malvern nanosite and so by loading that up into into an optical cell you can actually count the particles and then get a particle number that way. So we do all three of those monitor the, the absorption spectrum, the ICP mass spec, and the, the particle counts, and we can have a pretty good idea of what that particle concentration is. And, and just to be clear, with, with every single <laughs> lot of particles that we generate, we're going to be looking at them on the electron microscope, which we have in-house. We're going to be measuring the DLS, the dynamic light scattering signal, to look at their aggregation state. We're going to be running ICP MS to get a, an accurate measure of their concentration. Um, I mean, all of these things for every single lot of particles that go out the door. That's different to a lot of other places which are not quite so, don't have such a large emphasis on particle characterization. Okay, um, and with that, just a follow-up question. Um, does the antibody binding change that OD characterization that you discussed? It, it does a little bit. In general, when you bind something to the surface of the gold nanoparticles, you change the um, refractive index close to the surface of the gold nanoparticle. And it, changing that refractive index uh, changes the, um, the plasmon resonance of the particle. So usually when you bind something to the surface of the gold, most things have a higher refractive index than water, antibodies being one of them. And you'll see a small shift in the... Uh, maximum OD of the gold nanoparticle. It's certainly something we look for. If, if you see a large shift or you start to see a broadening of the peak, it tells you that you've got some aggregation going on as well. Um, we'd be quite happy to talk to you or look at spectra that you have and we can explain quite a lot about what's going on with aggregation and binding things to the surface based off the UV-Vis spectrum. 
Thank you so much, um, Steve and Richard. Um, this question uh, comes from Bill. Uh, do your particles uh, lead to improvement in assay precision? So, um, in the case of the 40 nanometer gold, when we use a covalent binding, what we get is a lot more control over the amount of antibody that's on the surface of the particles for, for a given reaction. And certainly for some of the quantitative assays that we've done, um, we've been able to adjust the amount of antibody on the surface to make sure that the particle that the, the assay is always giving the same response over the same range. Um, for the gold nanoshells, um, in, in terms of precision, I'm not sure that we have enough data to really show whether it's improving the, the precision, but we are using the same covalent chemistry on the surface, so I'm assuming that by that same level of control over the amount of antibody on the surface, we've managed to reduce one of the uh, potential sources of uncertainty. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, I have another question from John. Um, this was, um, you had mentioned some quantum dot composites. Are alternate emission excitation wavelengths available for the quantum dot shells? Yes. So, so we've been able to make quantum dot shells for a range of different colors. Um, we don't make the quantum dots in-house, so, so we're beholden to other suppliers for the particular wavelengths, but we can do pretty much anywhere across the visible spectrum. Great. Um, this other uh, question comes from, um, from Charlie. Uh, this is about your QC and QA. Um, how often do you uh, do QC on these particles? Every single lot. And then I guess as, as a follow-up, yeah, so what, I mean one of the concerns or one of the, the concerns that we've had from the community, you know, with 40 nanometer gold especially, is that, that there is some lot-to-lot -lot variability associated with, with the different productions. So the way, the way that we've addressed that is to not only make um, different lots here and do three lot validations for people, but we're running internal QC tests where we're not just looking at the particle characteristics, but actually how those characteristics impact a, an actual test assay. Uh, the, you know, the, the second piece to that is that that lot-to-lot -lot variability is, is eliminated if you can have very large lots. And so we've been looking at, um, uh, we're, we're moving to sort of to the, the 100 to 200 liter lot size, and we've been able to, to track those for you know, having you know year or multi-year stability. So it's really our hope in terms of supplying to the community for people that are just looking for another source of 40 nanometer gold, is to provide this this source that uh, allows them to to swap things in and out with without having to re-optimize their, their 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 conditions for for the assay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, this question comes from James. Uh, how does the stability of the nano shells compare against the 40 nanometer gold, both in the bare colloidal form and in the conjugated form? Okay, so so when they're conjugated, they behave about the same. You need to be aware that the particle, the, four, the gold nano shells, are larger than the 40 nanometer gold, and if you leave a container of them sitting for a week it will tend to concentrate towards the bottom of the container. However, you shake it up and it goes back up in solution. I mean, it doesn't require anything tricky, you just got to shake it. Um, in terms of colloidal stability before conjugation, all of our gold nanoshells are provided with a carboxylic acid surface for um, covalent conjugation. We don't provide them naked for physisorption. The, the Carboxylic acid on the surface, as long as you keep the pH right, right, they have a really good um, zeta potential. They stay colloidally stable indefinitely. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate that. Um, so, <clears throat> another question um, we have from our audience, uh, from Partha, is: um, In a competitive assay, can you limit the amount of antibody per particle? Yeah, so, so when we're using covalent conjugation, we, we have a, a range of different ways that we can control the amount of antibody on the surface. Um, we can change the stoichiometry, um, we can use a mix of antibody that's going to bind and antibody that's just a dummy antibody, or we can control the time of the reaction. Um, in, a, in a given protocol for doing the conjugation, you need to be very carefully controlling all of those things, and that lets you um, reduce 
the amount of antibody that's present on the surface. And we've, we've used this to be able to move the uh, dynamic response of these competition assays into the right region for a you know for the for the clinically relevant range. Um, this can be really challenging for competition assays. I mean, in the, in the competition assay, inherently a small amount of analyte is leading to a small variation of a strong signal. Um, this ability to, to adjust the amount of antibody on the surface of the, the gold nanoparticles when you're doing um, covalent conjugation easily lets you move that frame around such that you can spot that small variation of a large signal. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from Shirley. Uh, what is the advantage of having a silica-coated particle instead of direct conjugation of antibodies on the gold quantum dot or other reporters? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, so what happens with with gold particles and fluorescence is that there's actually an interaction, uh, like an electronic interaction, um, with the the states of those of those two entities, in that the fluorescence can actually be quenched. So if you put a fluorescent molecule directly on the surface. Of a, of a gold or silver particle, it'll lose its fluorescence capability. So we have to build a, a spacer layer um, that, uh, that separates it from the metal surface. So the metal's there to act as an antenna. Unfortunately, you can't put it right on the surface, so you have to space it off a certain distance. And that just happens, to, that just has to do with sort of the physics of, of what happens when uh, these fluorescent molecules bind to a, are bound or close to a metal surface. Thank you, Steve. Um, another question from our audience. Um, what is the size of the nano shell um, you use in your tests when compared to the 40 nanometer gold nanoparticles? It's a great question. So the nano shells are of the order of about 150 nanometers in size. They're the ones that we've found uh, uh, give the, the best uh, trade-off between size and signal. Um, this puts them much bigger than a 40 nanometer gold particle, but significantly smaller than the 300 nanometer latex beads that are used for lateral flow assays. Great, thank you. Um, I think at this point uh, we're going to conclude the question and answer uh, section of our of our presentation today. Um, again, I'd like to thank um, both Steve and Richard for sharing this valuable information to our audience. Um, and I'd like to thank our audience just for attending today's webinar. Technical resources and our lateral flow handbook can be accessed online by going to the handbook section on our website at www.nanocomposites.com under the technical resource tab. Um, if you would like to reach any of our technical staff or for additional questions, um, the email you can address those questions to is listed um, on your screen, which is info at nanocomposites.com. Um, or if you'd like to reach us by phone, our phone number um, is also listed. Following the webinar, you will receive a survey um, on today's presentation, and we would greatly value your feedback. Um, you will receive a link uh, to view a recording of today's webinar. Um, you can also visit previously recorded webinars on our knowledge base section on our website. And on behalf of Nano Composites and our presenters, Dr. Stephen Oldenburg and Dr. Richard Baldwin, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today.